Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, everyone getting up early to come to the morning session and really enjoy discussing this. I am a surgeon. I do both endoscopy and surgery, as I have found uh, many other surgeons worldwide do. So, and I do um, um, pancreatic resection for my patients when the endoscopy fails. So it's a, it's a good perspective to have, to have um, both approaches in one area. And I would agree uh, with what Martin has said at the last talk that um, it is not a matter of competition, but it's a matter of the appropriate use of these procedures. And I would encourage you as surgeons, mostly in the audience, to uh, at least designate or help get one of your people trained in interventional endoscopy and ERCP because I think we can do it the best to coordinate things for a patient uh, over the long term and there is enough work in most surgical departments to support someone to learn that and then maintain those skills. So just an encouragement to make available uh, to your fellows some of the, uh, some of the um, fellowships uh, that are available. Okay, well I'm going to talk about endoscopic options and not surgery really, although I'll be mentioning surgery as part of it really. Um, the three things I'm going to talk about are pancreatic stenting, endoscopic pseudocyst drainage, and then pancreatic debridement, which now is becoming a little more popular. Well, you know, is pancreatic stenting useful at all? I think that's a, a, a difficult question to answer. And then should pancreatic stenting be used prior to surgical treatment? Um, in other words, if you have clear-cut indications for surgery, it, it should, should endoscopic approach be, be done? Well, there are several studies in the last four or five years which really address the issue of, of how well patients do with stenting. The problem is their results 